Okay. So this is actually a bud dissection that Luis Sanchez filmed when they were doing this. So I thought this would be helpful just from the conversations that Ashraf and Matt described with these bud dissections. So this is actually with a sharp blade. Gallo does a lot of bud dissections to help project their crop yields that they're going to have. And it's actually like magic in this one picture. So they actually slice back into here, and then they're popping out one of those cluster primordia. So this is all actually embedded in that cluster, like was described, formed the previous year. And so when you slice this open, you can actually see these bits. Luis is incredible at this. He has like surgical precision with the cuts that he makes, and he's been doing tens of thousands of these things for years. So he's making it look very easy in this, but it is possible to see the necrosis, whether those buds are alive, and they get some counts based on the clusters and things. So I thought this would be useful to actually see. So I'm a water relations specialist uh, with USDA and, and UC Davis in the viticulture and enology uh, department. So I was asked to talk about grapevine water relations, actually explain what that means to, to neophytes that are here today. And I'm also going to touch a bit on, so it's, it's grapevine water relations here, but, and I'll do a bit of soil. So it's kind of hard to talk about water relations without putting it in the context of what's going on with soils. And so in the talk today, I'm going to talk about why this is important. I'll get into physiological uh, reasons of why the, uh, plants, why the grapevines need water and how they're using it most effectively. A lot of it is very similar to our own metabolism. I'll talk about uh, what it can be a confusing topic of the concept of water potential, and I'm going to break it down into its component parts. And then I'm going to talk about something that was a problem here during the, the last drought, and we heard a bit about this from Matt earlier in the day, of root pressure and bud push during long extended droughts and how you actually can deal with this uh, issue. We'll look at long distance transport, both in terms of water and sugars and the mechanisms that are behind that, cellular water relations, how water is actually driving the growth in all the different tissues, stomatal control of gas exchange, of exchanging water for carbon dioxide in the leaves in order to do photosynthesis, and then I'll wrap it up with a bit of deficit irrigation and putting it into a practical context of, of how it's actually used. So just starting off for plants in general and grapevines uh, as well, there's four main uh, reasons why water is so important. It acts as the primary solvent for gases. So CO2, even though it comes in as a gas, it ends up in liquid phase for when it's going through photosynthesis. If you have minerals, think of this like your fertigation. We're dissolving a lot of salts and other minerals in that fertigation, delivering that water effectively in that way. And ultimately, aqueous solution is the site of all metabolic reactions. So everything that's going on in the cells is actually in a water state. It's a major constituent in plants. So it makes up 70 to 95% in grapevines. The part that holds most of the water is actually the leaves and that herbaceous part of the plants. And it's really important for the hydrostatic skeleton. So the droopiness of the leaves when they're losing their turgor, we'll talk about how that actually is generated later on. That's from water actually flowing into that tissue, flowing into those cells, helping it stand upright, or helping it to avoid the sun and, and get away from excess radiation and cool itself more effectively. And then finally, it's a reactant. It actually gets split in the photosynthetic process. It donates electrons uh, in, in that process. And it's a currency. So a lot of water is needed, uh, and it actually just comes into the grapevines and passes through right to the atmosphere. So for every one molecule of CO2 that's actually absorbed by a grapevine leaf, they're losing on average 400 molecules of water. They open up their stomata, CO2 is diffusing in, and water is getting sucked out of that by the dry atmosphere. So it's a wet surface inside the leaves, and it's actually just evaporating off of there. And this trade-off actually ends up giving some cooling effects. So similar to us sweating, and, and we're transferring some of that energy coming in, and you're evaporating water just like you do on your stove, the plant is also doing the same thing. The process of evaporating that water is actually cooling the leaves, keeping the enzymes in their optimum position so that they can actually do the photosynthesis. So for how this actually uh, matters for all of you that are trying to do irrigation management, what you really care about is how much water to put on. So that's impacted by the atmospheric demand, how dry is the air, how much water is being pulled through that, what do the plants actually have access to in the soil, I'll touch base on this, and then when to apply it. So we really, for the apply it side of it, we want to understand the stress, we want to understand the growth phase of the plants, and put it on at the appropriate times, like we saw with Ashraf's talk, to, to get the intended effects of putting on these treatments in, in the right time. 
The two pictures in the bottom are things potentially to avoid. The one on the bottom left is excessive growth that can come in mesic habitats. This is actually from the east coast of the US, showing a whole lot of growth that can actually occur. And then on the right, it's actually a situation where they have imposed too much drought on the vines, and you can actually get the leaves blowing off uh, the vines, and they'll start doing leaf drop. And ultimately, all the plant is doing is if you've ever seen planet Earth and the quiver trees in the desert that actually drop whole branches, so all they're doing is trying to get rid of their evaporative surface area and limit water loss. So they actually just start dropping leaves to, to eliminate that. But you're also then losing photosynthetic capacity, the ability to make sugars, and the ability to send that sugar into your fruit. So there's trade-offs for all of this. So in terms of the bigger picture of the, the balance of water, we think of this uh, a lot, and you can think about your vines almost like them stuck in an individual pot in, in the field uh, for the water balance. So you have changes in the soil water that's available to the plant to use, and this ends up being impacted by precipitation and irrigation inputs. So one that we can manage, the other um, that we have no control over this. Much of that water uh, will actually drain below the surface, so you have an active rooting system that has a certain depth, and much of the water and anything else is carrying, like nitrates and dealing with sigma and the new water regulations that are here in the state, it will carry water and other chemicals down below the rooting zone. So it's not available for use, but it may also be useful for leaching salts, depending on where you're doing growing and other things. And then we have the losses from the system. So that's the drainage is the loss out of the bottom. You have runoff in a place like Napa on the hill slopes, where you're putting the water on, you can end up getting a lot of that running off of the system. Uh, and then the big water loss in, in the system is evapotranspiration. So this is the water that's lost by the stomata opening up and water evaporating out of those leaves, as well as what's lost from the soil itself. And so there's lots of ways to actually do irrigation management. Uh, and I think um, Daniele Zaccaria will touch on this. Uh, the Larry Williams actually did a whole lot of work with a Wang lysimeter. That is actually a potted vine. There was actually two potted vines in a, a vineyard down at the Kearney Ag Center in Fresno, and it was sitting on a load cell that would actually measure how much water was coming off of that. The numbers from that have then been translated all over the world to actually get irrigation estimates under certain climatic conditions. There's all sorts of technology that you can place in the soil, soil moisture sensors. There's sap flow sensors that can actually measure uh, the water moving through the trunk. Um, there's other things that we've developed in the lab that actually measure how much water is evaporating out into the atmosphere. So there's all sorts of technologies that you'll hear more about that that actually allow you to do this water budget. I'm going to stay focused more on the, on the physiology of the vines with water relations. So factors that you'll hear from other people that talk to you about making decisions uh, about vineyard establishment and rootstocks and things, there are a lot of factors that will end up impacting the water use. The first is the climate that you're actually growing in. So how hot and dry is the air and, and how much is it going to actually be sucking the water out of, of, of the plant and the soil itself? What are the growth stages of the vine? When you have like the pictures that Matt showed with very little leaf area, you have very little water demand at that point because there's not much evaporative surface area uh, from that. As those leaves grow, the canopy fills in, you have more uh, demand for water from that. Is there a cover crop actually present in, in your field which will actually deplete those water resources that, that are available? And this can be um, good or bad depending on how you use it. And then canopy size and trellis type, row and vine spacing, orientation, all these things will impact how much radiation. Ultimately, all of that water loss is driven by solar radiation coming in from sun. The leaves absorbing that radiation, and then that is what actually causes this evaporation of water. So orientation of the canopy and how that actually intercepts that radiation coming in can have a big effect on this. So vineyard slope and aspect will also get at that, depending on which way you're facing. Uh, vine health, if there's a virus in it, it could reduce the amount of water loss through there, uh, photosynthetic rates dropping. And then other things like in the soil, is there a hard pan down here? What is the actual rooting depth? So how, how much water can the plant actually access in this case? And what is the soil type? And I'll touch base on this a little bit more in, in terms of the soil type. How many of you have actually done water potential measurements before? Just a handful. Okay, I thought it would be uh, more than that potentially. So this is a pressure bomb on the left-hand side. This is one of the most common ways uh, that we actually track stress in, in grapevines. So the way that this is done is you take a plastic bag, you go out and you breathe in that plastic bag, so it's a human bag, you put it on a leaf, you clip that leaf off of the plant, 
and then you put it inside this chamber here, and there's a nitrogen tank associated with this. And what you're doing is, is when you cut that leaf off of there, the water retracts back into the tissue. And you can think of this like a rubber band that has a weight on the bottom of it. So water, and I'll explain this in a second, is actually under tension in the plant. It's being pulled through by a vacuum, so that evaporative water loss. So it's like a rubber band here, and you cut that thing, and it's going to retract back in. So it takes a certain amount of pressure to push that water then back to the surface, and that's what you're doing with a pressure bomb. So you put a leaf in here. When it was cut, the water retracted back. It doesn't actually look like Old Faithful. That's why it says artist con uh, conception here of what this actually looked like. It actually just barely pushes back to the surface. Um, but you're getting that water that retracted back in to come to the surface. It gives you a pressure for how much, how much pressure it took to get it back to that surface. And that gives you an idea of how much tension this thing was under in the system. This is what I'm going to talk a lot about today, is what is the meaning of this value? And, and how is the plant actually adjusting this in order for water to flow in the direction that it wants to go? So in describing uh, these forces that are involved in, in water movement through the plant, so it's moving from one place to another, this is the water potential. And so it's a measure of the potential energy. It's actually the, the potential chemical energy, but potential energy is fine for what we're talking about today, of water relative to pure water. The values of this can be positive, like with a super soaker gun where you're squeezing that water and compressing um, or putting pressure on it and then it blows out. You'll have positive pressures there. Versus the tension is actually, like I just described, water is sticky and can hold to itself. That tension is a negative pressure. And so water can both be positive pressure or negative pressure. And we're going to talk mostly on the negative side within plants. So the symbol for water potential is psi. Uh, it's measured in units of pressure, like we talked about with the pressure bomb of bringing that back to the surface. And for pure water at room temperature at sea level, so this has got a, little, a lot of disclaimers in it. So thinking elevation, you raise that up, you're changing a pressure head on the water. Um, at room temperature, you change the temperature of, of that water, you're changing the activity of it. And pure water with nothing dissolved in it. So as soon as you start dissolving things in it, you start lifting that water to height, like you do in your, in your vineyards with reservoirs and things like that, you're changing the potential energy of this water. In a positive way here with the water towers raising that up, it becomes a positive pressure head because gravity is pulling on that. Versus in these other cases, when you have a matrix, like a sponge, it has a whole lot of surface area and a whole lot of pores that are actually sucking that water into it. And it gets absorbed to all of that internal surface area. And then it takes a force then to get it back out of there. So this is like the soil. So you have water getting pulled into those capillaries. And it takes a force by the plant to actually suck it out of, of that soil. And the same thing with dissolving any sorts of solutes in water. It's going to bind the water and reduce its energy in um, in, in some way. So I'll break this down a little bit more for you as we go here over the next series of slides. So water movement is driven by differences in water potential. So it always goes and it continues until equilibrium. And this will be important for some of the examples that I show you. So it always goes from high water potential to low water potential. So tower of water down to on the ground you have this gravitational high water potential up here sitting there and it's going to drain down via gravity to that point. In the plant, it's actually flipped because we're dealing with negative numbers. So you have the matrix of the plant that's holding onto that water. Think cell walls, think um, solutes, think sugars in the cells. All of those things are going to want to hold on to the water. So it actually reduces the ability of that water to do work. And so in the plants, we tend to go from zero would be the high value of water potential, which is generally in the soil, approaching zero. And the plant is negative. So it's going to go from high to low in this case. And I'll come back to that in, in the examples again. So always thinking high to low. This came out a little bit small. Sorry about that. So what we have in the upper right here is what actually drives the water through the plant during the day and the water potential gradient that is set up. So here on the y-axis, you have the high value of 0 and much lower values down to minus 100 for the atmosphere. And the, the leaves themselves somewhere approaching minus 2 megapascals. And what happens is, is the stomata open up, water starts to evaporate from those leaves, and then you get a pool and a tension starts to develop in that. So it's under negative pressure. And that negative pressure is the highest in the leaves. It's a little less than that in the stems, a little less than the roots. 
but you can see there's a gradient. The value in the soil is closest to zero, it's the highest, and then it's going to flow from these high values towards the leaf. And ultimately, that bulk of that flow is driven by this evaporation that's created and reducing the potential energy of that water. Um, I have 10 brothers and sisters. I'm used to being interrupted. So if there are questions that you want to interject and that's really pressing as you go, feel free to do that. So what actually happens at night in these systems is that we have this equilibration that I talked about before. So you cut off transpiration from those leaves. The stomata actually close up at night. And then you don't have water being lost to the atmosphere. And what happens is, is that the plant actually equilibrates, for the most part, with the soils. So if you've heard about pre-dawn water potentials, that people take those measurements, and it can give you an approximation of what the soil water potential is. So the plant is sitting there. It's closed off its stomata. It's not losing any more water to the atmosphere. It's sitting in the soil, and at night, water continues to flow into that plant, and it equilibrates with the wettest part of the soil at night. And that's why pre-dawn water potentials can actually give you uh, an estimate of what your soils actually look like in terms of this. So you still see a little bit gradient that's continuing here. It ends up starting like this in the evening and settling out. And then this whole thing just repeats day and night over time. So to reiterate some of these points, the high end of the gradient, so in the soil, so this is going to be closest to the zero. You have fine roots, and this is a picture of grapevine fine roots from a, a root stock that we work on. And those fine roots end up doing the bulk of the water absorption in grapevines. They go in and they grow all of this surface area to actually get into the pores of the soil and absorb as much of that water as possible. So they're really intimately connected to all of this uh, matrix in the soil. And the soil ultimately, again, because of this equilibration, defines the highest potential water potential that the plant can actually have. So the plant is always going to have to have a water potential that is lower because it's going from high to low. It has to be lower than that of the soil in order for the water to flow in. Otherwise, it can go in the opposite direction. And that actually happens in plants in, in some cases. So the other end of the gradient that we have, the low end of the gradient, is the air. And you can see from this here in Napa in the middle of July, if you look at a relative humidity of about 60% in the middle of the day, the water potential of the air in that case is going to be somewhere close to minus 100 megapascals. So the plants are actually dealing with this incredible gradient. So they're at about minus 2 at the very most negative that you would ever see inside their leaves. As soon as they open their stomata up, there's this really big gradient that's sucking the water out of those leaves. And that is driven by the dry atmosphere that we actually have here uh, in California where we're doing this. So this is a picture of changes in the water potential as the soil is drying out. Uh, and just to reiterate some of this equilibration that's actually going on. So there are three lines on this plot. So the solid line that doesn't wiggle too much is the soil. You have another solid line in the middle of that is a root water potential. And then the dotted line is the leaf water potential. So along the x-axis, we have time and days. And then you have the water potential of those different parts on the y-axis. And so the black bar at the bottom of each of the days is the nighttime, and the white is the daytime. And so what you see is, is that you have good equilibration uh, at the start of this. And then as the stomata open, you get a drop in the water potential. So that water is getting under tension in the leaves, a little less so uh, in the root. But you have a gradient from high to low so that water is flowing into the plant and getting up to the leaves of where it's actually needed for photosynthesis. As that soil dries out over time, its water potential is dropping. And, and this will become more apparent in the next couple slides when I talk about the soil. But essentially, the easily accessible soil water is gone. And then the stuff that's bound to a lot of that surface matrix that's harder to get is causing this water potential to drop. So it's becoming harder, its potential energy is dropping down because the soil wants to hold on to that water as well. So this is dropping over time, and the plant has to continue to drop with this. So if we go out to this point, the plant has adjusted its water potential down to ensure that water is still moving from the soil into the plant. So you always have this gradient going in, in that direction. So I, yes? So Excellent question. So you're, I'll give you $5 afterwards for leading me into my next slide. 
So what can actually happen, so for that exact reason, as I was driving this, that it's always going in this direction. What, uh, 15 years ago, before I came to this job, I, I actually worked on deep tree roots in caves, like 20 meters below ground. There were underground streams down there, and it was pure water at depth where they, these roots from these trees were actually accessing this. So this is 60 to 70 feet below ground. And what we would actually see is that at nighttime, water would be flowing up from these deep roots and coming up into the shallow soil. And we were actually tracking this, and you can see this with these precipitation events here. So you'd get a precipitation event, and it would knock down nighttime transpiration. So anything above the zero point here is, is flow going through those deep roots at night. And so what was happening is this precipitation was falling in the soil moisture here. It was wetting it and changing that hydraulic gradient. And water then wasn't getting pulled up and moved to here. And then it would dry out over time. So the soil, the shallow soil would start to dry. And then the nighttime flow would come up through those roots and out into the soil. So this has actually been documented in grapevines by Dave Smart. So the same thing is happening. They called it transverse. But you have one root on one side of the plant in a dry patch and another on the wet side, and water is going at night from the wet patch over into the dry patch. And it actually acts to keep the fine roots alive. It allows them to continue penetrating into that dry soil so that water, when water com becomes available in the future or to access nutrients, they can actually fully um, take, take that in. So good question. Okay, and then there's another time that you can actually get reverse stuff, which is actually detrimental to what you're trying to do with grape growing is uh, after um, verasion, uh, when, when you start to get the maturation of those berries, you can have times where the water potential in the plant in the middle of the day is actually low enough that it starts sucking water out of those berries. And so you'll see people manipulating the irrigation around harvest time a lot to maintain the size of those berries and not to get some of this dehydration that actually occurs. So you can actually have, there's a whole lot of sugars in here that decrease the water potential of those berries. So sh water flowing into those, but at times, the suctions from the leaves can become great enough that it actually pulls the water back out of those berries. It's also one of the reasons why growth of berries occurs at night, because they're not competing with, with the suction of water from those leaves. And so they have plenty of water to then actually expand those cells and, and things at night. OK, so we're going to go into the components of the, of the water potential values. So there are four components that come from this. So this is the total leaf water potential that we get when we do those pressure uh, values. Gravitational potential, I included this. Uh, while in vineyards, it ends up not being that important for the plants. But in, in plant biology, if you're trying to move water hundreds of, of meters up to the top of a redwood tree, you're fighting gravity to actually get it up there. And you have to continue to lower your water potential to make sure that the water actually gets to the top of the trees. The physics of this actually limits how tall trees can get in terms of them being able to lower their water potential enough to get it to that point. Why I mention it here is you actually end up dealing with this in your irrigation system. So when you think about moving water around, whether you're having to pump it uphill through the drip irrigation lines, or whether you're putting it up into a reservoir and using that pressure head, you are actually taking advantage of gravitational potential of water to actually move it from one place to the other in, in the vineyards. So I thought that would actually be worth mentioning in this. And it's, actually part of the formal equation. So the second uh, component of this is the matrix potential. So this is like the sponge. So lots of surface area. So you have small pores or small capillaries. And they have a ton of surface area that actually attracts the water and holds on to that. And it takes some force to get out of this. And this is where I'm going to get into the soils for just a little bit. So if we actually think of our, our pot of vine out in the field, and this is a pie chart of the, the soil water available at full saturation. Imagine just doing this at home. You have a potted plant, you water that thing, and you end up getting some drip out of the bottom of this. That's why we have those plates there so it doesn't make a mess all over our house. So that water is actually gravitational water. So the drainage that's just pulling through the system and draining out of there, that's actually not accessible to the plants. So you super saturate this thing, and you get water leaving out of the bottom of the system, and it's not actually useful. That's why actually targeting a certain volume to match the demand of the plant makes a lot of sense. Otherwise, you're blowing water out of the bottom of your system. The water that is actually available is called capillary water. So that's this portion of the pie here. And it's the water that's left in the soil after the excess drain, so after that gravitational water is gone. And it's what's held in place by surface tension, by those tiny little capillaries uh, in the soil. So this is what is available to the plants. 
And then the last part of that is the hydro hygroscopic water. And this actually, there's a lot of water still in the soil, depending on your soil type. And you actually have to, the only way you can get it out of there is by oven drying it in, in some ways. So there's no way that the plant is actually going to be able to extract this, this water in that case. These differences in terms of the, uh, this type of water that's actually available to the plants depends on the type of soil that you're dealing with. So we talk about three main types of soils. So sand being the largest particles that we have, silts, and then the clay particles are these tiniest ones. And if you do a quick calculation of the surface area per volume ratio of just an individual sur uh, uh, soil particle, you can see that there's a whole lot more surface area per volume of each one of those particles of clay. Stack all of that clay together in that, and you have a tremendous amount of surface area, which is actually holding on to that water and wanting to absorb it. And by packing smaller particles together, you also make smaller capillaries. So those smaller capillaries will tend to hold on to that water more strongly. So that's why you may have a lot of water actually in the soil in a clay, but what's actually available is only this upper percentage here. And you have a whole lot of water here that's unavailable in a clay soil just because the plant actually can't extract it from those tiny little capillaries and all of that surface area. Versus in a sand, we call these well-drained soils, there's a lot of the water in something that has these big giant particles like this is actually just draining right through the system. And the capillary size doesn't allow them to hold on to that water and gravity ends up winning that fight. So you have very little water in these systems compared to what's available in some of these other ones. So this ends up being really important in terms of establishing your vineyard, knowing what types of soils you have, and how the plants are going to have to actually extract that water from these different soil types that are there. So the third main component of the water potential gradient, and these two last ones that I talk about are the most important ones in terms of how the plants are dealing with moving water around. So um, this next one is the osmotic, and this is the dissolving of any solute. So in general biology, uh, you've heard of osmosis, and this is just the passive diffusion of water into cells. You have a cell membrane, you have solutes inside that, and water actually going into this. And so this is the effect of dissolved solutes. Any of you that have kids, and, and your kid, maybe I shouldn't even admit this at this point, but I'm still a relatively young parent, um, but you take them somewhere to a creek, and they're wearing diapers of, as a very small kid, and you don't have those swim diapers with you. And if you watch what happens to those diapers, uh, over time, they, they end up exploding, actually, because they have this material in it that loves water and absorbs that water, and it keeps going and keeps going and going until your kid's walking with this giant like, trunk on, on themselves. So they, you may have actually run these experiments yourself in, in like a freshwater water creek. So we're looking at how cells actually accumulate osmotica, and then we also have to consider this in terms of salts and other things. So Salts in the water will also affect the osmotic uh, uh, capability of the soil. If you have a lot of salts here, those salts will actually bind that water and make it harder for the plant to actually extract it, in addition to toxic effects. And Mark Batney could give you all sorts of details about this. So I'm going to give you an example of osmotic stress, or uh, of how osmotic potential actually works. If we actually start with a glass tube here, we take a semi-permeable membrane. So this is the plasma membrane, the cell membrane that's inside a plant cell. And you stick it on the bottom of this glass tube. If you then take a sugar solution, so it has an osmotic potential of minus 10. So those solutes, the sugars that are actually in there, have reduced the potential of the water. And then you drop that thing into pure water. That's actually supposed to be blue. I guess our, it's a little bit tainted. Uh, and so you take this pure water, which has zero. This is high water potential moving towards low water potential here. And what actually happens is that column of water actually rises until it reaches an equilibrium state with that. So this is actually occurring in your vineyards right now. So this effect of osmotic potential in the plants is actually going on with the bleeding that we see and with what we heard a little bit about before. So when you prune grapevines in the spring, they'll actually start pushing water out of those, and you get this bleeding effect from that. Well, what's actually happening there in a physiological sense is that the plants are actually dumping sugars. They start putting sugars into the xylem tissue. They have subarin, which is the same compound that's found in cork oak trees that we use for actually bottling the wines. It's really impermeable to, uh, to liquids. Uh, the same thing is actually going on in, in the roots of your plants. So they actually subarize what is called the endodermis, so the cylinder that's in here, it wraps around the xylem tissue. And then by subarizing that endodermis, it's actually laid down in the cell wall. 
it forces water to cross a cell membrane and creates this position where osmosis can actually happen. So you end up loading sugars into the xylem, and then water gets drawn into that. It gets attracted to that water, and it gets pushed up, and it creates a positive pressure actually inside the plant. So this was actually, people originally thought 50 years ago that that was how water actually moved in grapevines. Um, and they were arguing whether the original theories from the late 1800s versus water actually being pushed through. So you can get water movement by positive pressure in grapevines at this time of year, but it's the only time that you would end up seeing it in the plants. What we actually found, there was a PhD student that worked with Andy Walker, and she actually found that 101.14, which is a common rootstock, actually pushes its buds earlier in the season. And we found that it was suberizing a lot more. It actually seals off, it, off its roots a lot more, which impacts its ability to take up water. But it also was helping it to actually seal this off, which allowed it to build up more pressure in there. So this ends up being really important this time of year for activating, and, and uh, the previous speakers touched on this a bit, it signals to the canopy that the roots are starting to get active. It rehydrates the buds before there is actually uh, an ability for water to move up there. It delivers cytokinins from the roots. It's refilling cavitated vessels, the air bubbles that get into the vessels that transport water. Uh, and it also is now thought that it's providing some sugar. So the phloem, which carries sugar around the plants, is not activated in the beginning of the season. And it's believed that they might actually be using this to transport some sugars to help develop those buds. And these are just some pictures of developing buds that are expanding out building off of what we saw from Matt and, and Ashraf from that. So the problems that were actually seen in the North Coast region, so I talked to Rhonda Smith about this, and she had lots of growers calling in. We had that long extended drought with some years where in the winter there was literally zero precipitation that was coming in. And they were finding that there was very little bud push in those conditions. And so ultimately what the plant is doing is saying, there's no water here. There's no point for me creating a whole huge canopy if I'm not going to be able to support it with water. In the, and I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing here, but ultimately that, that works out. They're controlling the surface area. So what was actually recommended here, um, and since water was not actually becoming available through precipitation, was to actually take and irrigate and fill the soil profile in the late winter. If you were assured that there was no water coming and you needed adequate bud push to actually get leaves, and to have the fruit that you're actually looking for in a production setting, that you should actually be filling the soil profile to actually get this push that's actually needed and the activation of those buds to have an adequate canopy. Okay, and then the final component um, that I'll get into and, and talk in more detail about this is the pressure potential. And so this is the pressure that I've alluded to uh, of the liquid water. It's zero atmospheric and it can be both positive, like we just saw from root pressure, or from like a squirt gun, or it can be negative, as again, I alluded to this. And this is actually where the bulk of water flow is occurring in, in plants. So in grapevines, again, to reiterate this concept, you have high water potential down near the roots and in the soil, and much lower up in the atmosphere, water is going to be flowing in this direction. It's driven by transpiration, so the bulk of water flow in plants is stomata opening up, water evaporating off from this point, and then it actually is a continuous Q cohesive column. So those water molecules are sticky to one another, and you get water from all the way up in the leaf surface where it's evaporating, being stuck to water molecules all the way down through the roots and into the soil. So it's actually this big, long column of water that moves, and the tension is transmitted through that column of water. And so this can actually be disrupted by cavitation. So that water column under tension <clears throat> is metastable, and it can actually snap if the tensions become too great in that. And it's very similar to embolism in our own vasculature. So we get an air bubble or a blockage in our vasculature, and it can be very detrimental to us uh, in, in many ways. You prevent fluid movement in our vasculature. The same thing can actually happen in plants. So what actually happens in here is these are three xylem vessels. So those are the conduits, uh, essentially the long straws that are carrying water uh, over long distances in the plant. So they're actually open uh, mostly on the ends, but they can be connected to vessels beside them. And if you zoom in on these connections between these, which is called a pit membrane, you have air in one of these that's at atmospheric pressure, and then the water is under tension uh, in that one beside it. And once this tension gets to a certain point, and depending on that pore size in the pit membrane, an air bubble can actually be pulled across. And it ends up, that air bubble coming in, ends up snapping the water column. 
So if you remember Hunt for Red October and turning the, the propellers the wrong direction, you're actually cavitating the water and creating voids. It gives off a sound, and actually plants give off audible clicks when they're actually cavitating and going through drought in a very similar way. And so this air bubble then forms in there. It blocks passage of water through that conduit. And grapevines actually have the ability to repair this. But we spent um, the better part of, of uh, my first decade here actually studying this, using all sorts of different directions. Grapevines, when I first got here, were originally thought to be hyper susceptible to cavitation formation. So any little tension that was formed in there, they thought that the vessels were actually cavitating and filling with air, which actually doesn't make very much sense evolutionarily to actually just have your, your transport system filled with, with air bubbles. So we've actually done a lot of CAT scan work um, down at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. And these are CAT scan images, micro CT images of looking inside a grapevine stem. And this is a stem water potential. So to those of you that have actually made measurements, you're almost never measuring something like this in the field. So this is incredibly stressed for a grapevine. And the little ring of black dots in the center of it are air bubbles, uh, are air filled conduits. And then it might be a little bit hard to see, but there's rows of vessels actually coming out from this and they're all continued to be water filled. You can actually see if you go down to the bottom right relative to this first image, after 16 hours, you see that air actually spreading through the system and cavitation forming, which will block that. But ultimately, there's still a lot of vasculature that's, that's still functional and water flowing through that. So we've actually found looking at a whole bunch of different plant parts, fine roots and petioles, looking in the leaves, looking in the stems, that cavitation in grapevines is not actually forming that much. And it's not something that we need to deal with in, in terms of a management sense. Well, what is actually happening, and this was worked by a recent PhD student, this is the cross-section of a fine root. So if you took this fine root and you cut into the middle of this, this is a CAT scan looking inside here. This is inside that endodermis that I talked about, and the xylem vessels are in the center. We actually subjected this thing to drought stress, and the xylem vessels stay filled with water, even though it was hypothesized that they should actually be emptying and air-filled. But what actually started happening is that a normal root should actually look like this with a whole bunch of cells going across this. The cells started tearing themselves apart. So the root was actually disconnecting itself from the soil and tearing apart its own tissue to prevent water loss from the xylem going back out in, into the soil in this case. And there's lots of reasons that I can talk to you about afterwards of, of why this might happen. So wanted to touch base on that, um, but ultimately xylem cavitation is not all that important, but other tissues seem to be affected by this. Um, more so. So in the last bit of the talk, I'm going to get into uh, interactive effects of osmotic and pressure potential, as, as I touched base on again. And this is kind of like your diaper experiment that you may have run in the past. So if you actually take a plant cell, it has a cell wall around it and a membrane in it. And if you drop that actually into a pure water solution, so it has sugars and other solutes actually inside there. It has a low water potential relative to that pure water. And what happens is, is that water is going to flow into the cell, and that cell membrane is going to push up against the wall. So it's like a balloon expanding up into this. It pushes all the way up against that wall, and then the wall starts pushing back. But this is actually where that hydro hydrostatic skeleton comes from. So those balloons actually expanding like that, just like if you actually took a limp balloon and blew it up, and you actually then have that force holding it up uh, rigidly, the same thing is happening in the plants. These cell membranes expand, expand out push against that cell wall. And this is actually called turgor pressure. So when we talk about loss of turgor and things. So what actually happened when this thing actually equilibrated is that you went with this osmotic potential here, water flowed in to a point that you built up 10 bars of pressure in, in the system pushing back. And plants can actually have tremendous pressure in there. So this is actually um, a tire because it's uh, either from Australia or the UK that, that this was actually spelled this way from the book that it came from. But car tire pressure in here, this is actually a root cell. So you can actually put these pressure probes into cells and measure how much pressure is inside them. Just for a relative value, you see what the root cell is doing, a leaf cell. And then this algae uh, itself is actually from salt water. So it has really low osmotic potential. You put it in pure water and it creates these incredible pressures in there, which are much higher than, than pressurizing. So this is inside your grapevines in the field. And they use this in many ways. Say so they use this turgor pressure to uh, actually expand cells. And I'll talk about that in just a second. One thing that you need to remember here, just taking a step back, is that you have this vasculature in the leaves, 
of where water is moving over long distances through this, but it's embedded with millions of cells in each of these leaves that want to hold on to water. They're trying to do photosynthesis. They have all these metabolic reactions. All of these cells inside a leaf actually have to have water potential that's low enough that some of the water that's coming up through the xylem is not just evaporating from these sites and leaving, so that they can actually get that water and pull, hold on to that. You can get conditions where these are filled cells from, from an algae that was actually worked on. Under drought stress, the cell membrane can actually be pulled all the way back and actually disrupt and pull off of the cell walls itself. So this is the deflated balloons and then blown up here where you would actually have the turgor holding up the leaves. So turgor ends up being really important in plants and grapevines can actually regulate this themselves. So as the soil starts to dry out, you're getting a drop in the water potential of that soil. The plant, again, will have to continue to drop in order for um, water to flow in the right direction. This would be at equilibration at night. What happens is the plant starts to sense this and it starts to accumulate. So it goes from minus 12 bars it starts to accumulate more solute. So it dumps proline and sugars and other things into cells. And that assures that all of those cells sitting in those leaves are still getting adequate water. So they drop their water potential. It allows water to flow in. And then that pressure inside the cell goes back up. And this allows for continued growth. It allows for expansion of the tissues and berries and other things. And so what's actually happening with cell expansion is this is a cellulose matrix, so that, that plant cell wall. And it actually looks like this. You have all the cellulose in there. You have these other compounds, pectins and hemicellulose, that hold all of these cellulose together. Plants actually send acid into that wall. It loosens the binding agents. And then when the balloon is being blown up, it actually pushes the wall out. And so cell wall expansion in turgor is actually a big part of that growth in the expansion of your berries, of any sorts of tissues that you're working on. The growth that we see, the fine root tips penetrating into soil, and then that, that growth of the berries that actually occurs over time is all driven by that turgor. We also get movements, um, tropisms, so moving towards um, uh, 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 the sun and other things, um, tendrils on the grapevines. If you actually looked at them in slow motion or actually spinning like a lasso at night on some plants looking for something to attach to, that's all driven by turgor. Structure, again, the hydrostatic skeleton of this. And then one of the most important things that plants are doing by manipulating turgor is opening and closing their stomata. And again, this is like two balloons that are attached and they're moving solutes in and out of these cells, these guard cells that are around the stomata. And they dump solutes into there, the water follows in, they swell up and it opens up the pore. And then the opposite when they're, they're actually getting rid of that water, so the efflux of that. So I'll actually, this one's a bit overwhelming. The point here is that water relations are also really important for sugar movement in plants. Thank you, Monica. Um, so they're actually dumping a lot of sugars into the phloem, and you have this huge concentration of sugar in there. Water is going to flow in from the xylem into your phloem. It builds up a pressure at that point, and then it moves from that high pressure point to somewhere that's lower pressure where actually the sugars are being pulled out of the plant. So phloem transport as well is also driven and impacted by water relations in the plant and just wanted to touch on that. So in the last couple slides that I have, I just wanted to touch base on the practical sides of this. So what you're trying to actually do in a lot of irrigation, especially up in this region, you're stressing the vines to improve quality of the fruit. And so we want to apply less than uh, water than the vines could actually use under ideal conditions. And this is one way of doing this is called regulated deficit irrigation. You're paying attention, you're taking measures of stress, and you're putting on the right amount of water to keep those things at a certain stress level or induce stress at different periods of time. And you end up doing this in order to reduce water use and, and associated costs with that, control excessive vigor. We heard about issues with shading of buds and things, um, reduce the cost for hedging and multiple leaf removal, disease pressure, because canopies will end up having higher relative humidity in them. And then also shrinking the harvest. In grapes, in table grapes, they want as much of that fruit to come off in the same period of time because they send people through for multiple harvests. The almond growers also use this for splitting the holes. They're manipulating the water relations of the plants by inducing stress and getting those things to split. So <clears throat> in this last slide, this is just a summary of what's actually happening. Going back to a lot of the concepts of what we talked about for water potentials, this is from Ted Chow who is still at UC Davis, wrote this article uh, in the early 1970s. And he summarized how plants were responding to drought stress with the growth parameter that's affected by this. 
And you use a lot of it, or you will be using in the future, a lot of these visual cues and things to actually do this. So very sensitive over here to drought stress and, le and, and less sensitive over in this direction. So we're going from uh, drops, something closer to zero, to this is actually a drop in water potential. So the first thing that we see in terms of deficit irrigation is a loss of turgor that we talked about. The balloons are not pushing against that cell wall anymore. And you start to see the tendrils drying up. You see the leaf growth stopping. And that's actually one of the visual cues that lots of people use going into the field. The very first thing that's impacted by that. Then you also start to get the stomata closing down. And this impacts photosynthesis and how much CO2 actually gets into the leaf in order to accumulate those sugars. And then eventually you get to a point where the xylem starts to cavitate, but it doesn't really impact uh, in terms of grape growing that much uh, anymore in terms of our new thought on this. And then, and then you eventually get to that osmoregulation where they're accumulating solutes in their cell to, to assure that their turgor is still there. You eventually can get to a point where you're blowing leaves off of these plants like I showed you before. And you can have long-term effects of decreased yield, leaf shedding, and carryover effects of affecting those buds of deficit irrigation for the following year. But ultimately, it's coming with increases in those secondary metabolites that we actually want to increase for the color and, and flavor and type of thing. So I'll actually finish with that. The summary is similar to what I already said. There's some cool videos that have been put out there by Ken Shackle and a former postdoc, Arturo Calderon, has done one on how to do uh, pressure bombing in Spanish as well for um, lots of workers that may be interested in looking at that. Sorry that I ran long, Monica, with that, and thanks for your attention. Yes? Can you go back uh, one slide? Yep. <clears throat> so when you end up imposing too much drought stress, so the mature leaves, they are down. They're a bit shaded. It tends to be the ones that are basal leaves. Their photosynthetic rate is not as high as the ones up near the top of the shoot. And it actually is that the cells start drying out. Photosynthesis, somata started closing down. And it's a feedback to the plant that this leaf is becoming a cost for me. It's continuing to do respiration and things, but it's not accumulating carbohydrates. And the whole tissue actually starts to disintegrate and go into senescence early. It drops that leaf to get rid of surface area and, and eliminate uh, how much transpiration is actually going on. So it's an acacia thirsty plant. Very thirsty plant, yeah. If you're getting to that point, that you're, you are at the point where it's pretty detrimental stress to, to the plants. Yes? So it's going to end up telling you, as those peaks that I showed you of where it starts off in, in equilibrium and then drops from that point, it tells you the most stress that the plant is going to be. And it integrates, really, where it came from in the soil. In an ideal condition, you would know where it started with a pre-dawn water potential. It depends on who you want to send out there at 5 AM. And then you would have midday. And the midday tells you atmospheric demand for water, how much it's actually pooling, how wide open the stomata are, how much water they're allowing to leave through there. So doing it at midday actually gives you a good integration of, of what the plant is feeling at the peak of when stress will be most severe. Good question. George, you're not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> yes. Yes. So I, I don't know the exact, it depends on what your production goals are with, with a vineyard like that. Down there, where you're trying to maintain yields because your cost per ton is so much lower, I would imagine that you want to do that. And most growers in that region would actually want to maintain as much of that yield as possible and prevent that shrivel. The same thing in the opposite direction actually happens in table grapes and, and juice grapes, where you can have too much water at certain times and the skin gets wimpy later on once it's matured, and it actually cracks, and the berries start blowing open from too much turgor inside there and too much sugar accumulation. So manipulating those both in the positive and the negative direction is, is important for different types of grape production. Yes? So water relation in the berries post-lactate, there's still free movement of water in and out of berries, or is it somewhat limited? Uh, uh, it's going to take a much longer answer to that question. So the xylem is thought 
that it starts cutting itself off. We've done CAT scans recently that shows that it's not totally doing that. But a lot of the water um, in berries at that stage is actually coming through the phloem. So you have sugars flowing in, and water is actually coming with them into the berries in, in that way. So that balance is still theoretically under um, debate of exactly how that's happening. Yes? Yes, sir. Yeah, the question was, is does it make sense to actually irrigate at nighttime and deliver it uh, at periods? Of time? Some people actually employ that strategy. I think it depends on how much water you're trying to apply. So if it's a smaller irrigation, I would say yes. But it depends on if you're wanting to affect the grape growth that's occurring at night. You might actually want it on there a little bit earlier. So the plant, as soon as the stomata close, they'll actually start taking it in if you want growth of those berries. And the other practical side of that, some places in the Central Valley, they, want it, they need to put so much water on that they have to do it 24 hours a day, that they're actually cranking that stuff into there. So it really depends on the production setting for that. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you.